Well, it's wonderful to be here. Um, welcome uh, to all of you here in the room, uh, and also welcome to the virtual audience tuning in with us as well. Um, this session uh, has the title, Excellence as the Outcome of Diversity. Uh, and what we're really looking at and exploring uh, in various different angles is how uh, diverse programming can cultivate excellence and how it can enrich our art form. It's quite a, a big subject. And before we go any further, um, I'd love to thank hugely um, the Boston Symphony Orchestra for their generous underwriting of this session. Um, yes, thank you. I'm exceptionally lucky to be joined on stage by these four wonderful people, wonderful musicians, wonderful thinkers. Uh, we have Melissa Munoz, Virginald Rash, Scott Dixier, and Dr. Seth Parker Woods. So the way the session's going to run is that the five of us are going to give a little introduction to ourselves. Um, then we're going to launch into a, a discussion. Um, then there will be a chance for you to ask questions, which we'll try our best to answer. Um, you can ask questions via the mic here um, or via the Sphinx app in the Q&A section of the REN Live tab with access code REN. Um, so you can be thinking about what you want to ask us. But to start with, um, I thought it might be just nice if we gave a little sort of mini bio each. Um, so we're just going to briefly say in about a minute each, who we are, a bit about what we do, and maybe how our work fits into this whole sort of topic. So Melissa, why don't you, you kick us off? Hello, uh, my name is Melissa Munoz, and I'm so excited to be here today with you all and with all of you wonderful folks here on stage. Uh, I am a trumpeter, an educator, and the Pathways Program Manager at the Calhoun Music Center. So I'm based in New York City, and uh, I think that I fit into this discussion because as a freelancer, um, I am one of the only Hispanic women who is in spaces such as the Metropolitan Opera, as a sub on Broadway, uh, Carnegie Hall, and various other spaces. As an educator, I have taught um, in a lot of different programs all over the US, ranging from outreach programs like the Music in Schools Initiative in New Haven, Connecticut, Jumpstart in California, all the way to my current job as a Upper East Side uh, School trumpet teacher. And as a Pathways Program Manager, my job is to enable these um, students to have access to resources to give them a really great music education. And all of these students are from historically underrepresented communities in classical music. So thank you. Brilliant. Um, good afternoon. My name is Virgil Rash. I live in Dublin, Ireland. Um, and you could probably tell from Tom's accent that he's not from around these parts either. Um, and what I do, I do a lot of things. I'm a clarinetist by trade, by training, but I'm also a curator. Um, being based in Ireland, I work on the board of Chamber Music Scotland and on the board of Crash Ensemble, Ireland's premier um, contemporary music ensemble. I also present on BBC Radio 3 and Radio 4 on occasion and on RTE Lyric FM. And I curate chamber music festivals and concerts and founded a nonprofit called Viva Musicale um, based in Baltimore, which is no longer in operation, but it was one of the, my first forays into concert curation. Now I'm curating a chamber music series at the National Concert Hall in Dublin, Ireland called From Antiquity to Modernity. And um, yeah, so that's that's why we're here. One, two, one, two. Hi, uh, my name is Scott Tixier, and I'm uh, from uh, France, from Paris. Um, I've been in America for 17 years, and uh, I moved here in America when I was uh, 19 years old or 20 years old, and I didn't speak any English. I moved to New York City, and I'm now a professor at the University of North Tex Texas. Uh, where I started the jazz string program and um, I also perform um, with my projects and uh, various different bands um, all around the, the world and uh, I'm a composer as well. Um, I have a twin brother <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I love being here and I'm, I'm, I can't wait to, to be part of this conversation. All this great um, artists and uh, thinkers, and uh, that's to you, Seth. <laughs> Hello. 
Uh, I'm Seth Parker Woods, a cellist, curator, and professor of cello and head of chamber music at USC Thornton School of Music. Um, a wide variety of the work that I've done over the years is looking at narrative storytelling. Um, also, another lens of that is through wearable technologies or technologies for uh, those that are uh, non able bodies. Um, but the work I've been doing as of late is really looking at past histories, looking at adornment, looking at uh, the Great Migration as a source of inspiration and joy to build new works. Um, that has kind of led me at the present day uh, to um, my largest project right now, which is called Difficult Grace, which is kind of really combining the works of Barbara L. Thomas, Jacob Lawrence, and poets Kemi Olave to create a, a rather long um, evening length uh, production on stage, which is now Grammy nominated, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, I feel very honored to be on stage with these four. Um, my name's Tom Poster, um, I live in London, um, and if any of you have seen me over the last uh, few days, it was probably running around the hotel in a circle with my two-year-old. Um, but I also uh, play the piano, I compose and arrange, uh, I love to program, um, and I suppose at the center of my musical life is Kaleidoscope Chamber Collective, which I founded a few years back uh, with Elena Yuriosti, uh, to whom I'm married and, and to whom many of you, I'm sure, will know. Um, I always feel the chamber music world has taken uh, longer to even sort of consider equity, diversity, and inclusion than, than even the rest of the music world, um, even though actually chamber music is the most equalizing uh, of all musical genres, in a sense. Um, so Elena and I just love bringing together, and I suppose at a certain point we realized that our circle of loved collaborators already happen to be a pretty diverse group, which is certainly not unrelated to all the connections that Elena built here at Sphinx um, over many years. Um, and I suppose we've grown things by really seeking out the most wonderful musicians uh, from the widest range of backgrounds and experiences uh, we can, and similarly looking to expand repertoire, giving voice to composers from underrepresented backgrounds. So I suppose, although I do many things, that's the happiest and um, most meaningful thing of, of my life at the moment, and it's definitely made, well, for me and Elena, it's made our lives more excellent. Uh, and that leads me on um, that the title of this um, session is Excellence as the Outcome of Diversity, and I thought we might just zoom in on that word, excellence. And I suppose the questions I wanted to put to my colleagues here um, are these. Um, how might we helpfully expand the definition and meaning of excellence beyond its sort of more conventional meaning of, you know, doing the best concert? Um, you know, the subject of that is that often I think what's going on behind the scenes is more crucial, arguably, than the shiny public face of what we do. Uh, and a sort of related question, um, is there an unfair pressure on organizations focusing on equity, diversity, inclusion to be excellent in the sort of traditional shiny sense rather than creating space uh, to grow naturally and to take risks? So um, I'd like to invite Melissa if, if you'd like to um, give us any thoughts you have and then we'll, we'll go along the line. Yes, absolutely. That is quite a question, it's a yes. <laughs> very long question, but it's a, it's a good one. And I, I wrote some notes here, so I just wanna make sure that I can get cool. what I had previously thought about. Um, so I think if you really kind of hone in on the word excellence, um, it's pretty vague, because it's really what you as a person define as excellence. Um, and for me, as I've learned throughout my career, um, Sometimes if you're being called excellent, you might not feel that it's excellent or that, you know, it's, it's just really not so black and white. Mm -hmm. So I think that if you are finding value in your art um, and if you're being really true to your values uh, all the way from when you started playing your instrument or what you're passionate about, that can really give you a sense of excellence if you're able to produce that. Um, so th that's kind of the biggest thing for me is as yeah. long as I'm staying true to my values and I feel like I am serving my purpose as a musician, that is excellent. Um, even if, you know, you don't win a competition or if you don't, um, you know, get the audition, if you feel like you represented yourself in a very true manner, then I think that's excellent. 
that's a really nice expansion of our definition already, I think. And Reginald, do you want to? Yeah, um, I think what happens is when we talk about excellence, we conflate excellence with perfection. And we're thinking excellence as the outcome of diversity, or we're looking for perfection. Obviously, we don't want mistakes. We want a blemish-free um, concert. We want an experience that is easily accessible, and all these things without acknowledging that when we say excellence, we're actually talking about this sort of striving for musical integrity, this striving for musical sort of transcendence. Uh, we all play music because we love it. We love the way the experiences we have making music the connections we make. So I think when we're looking at this word, we have to really define it for ourselves. And for me, there's when I'm, when I'm programming and I think of excellence, I think of, is this great music and am I playing great music with great people? And not just great people in terms of that they can play their instruments proficiently. I think we get to a certain point in our careers where yes, we can put our fingers on the right buttons and play the right notes and be in tune, hopefully. Um, but after that, are these excellent people? Are they changing or do they have positive impact in the way they enter a space? Are they impacting positively on the rehearsal environment? Are they contributing to the conversations and the communities that they live and they work in that advance diversity? And so when I think of programming, I think of the vibe that we're creating, That this, because it's not just the music. The music helps aid the vibe that we're wanting to create. I want to know more about the people and the energy that they bring to that space. Um, and so when I look at excellence, I think, are we looking at excellence as uh, an outcome of the work that they've done as a performer, or are we looking at excellence as a trajectory of the body of work that they want to create and where they are in relation to what the work they, they're doing? Um, so that's, I think excellence, is, it's, it's, it's this conflation of perfection, and we need to step away from that. Absolutely. Scott, I know you, you, we, we were just talking backstage about oh, yeah, this. Yeah, buzzword that's, a, that's a beautiful uh, question. And uh, I have to say that um, excellence has been a uh, um, a definition that has been fluctuating for me uh, and uh, throughout the years and there's many angles for for excellence and how to define it um, it could be in academia for example to define by grades and uh, <laughs> and uh, research uh, contributions but also um, as an artist it could be risk taking risk taking and um, uh, creativity but that would define excellence. But all those things are empty um, concepts if you don't really um, live them. To, to, for me, excellence is a, it's a process. It's, a, it's a, almost like a, a life um, uh, quest, um, in a way. When, when practicing your instrument, for example, I'm talking from, from my own uh, perspective and, and for years and years, you put you put the time, and you always have people that are ex exceptional, and they, you you see them as um, your either your heroes or your heroes or uh, your mentors, and you think about also the, the one you teach, and you are here in, in the middle of this, and I think what really defines excellence in those moments for me, it's. Um, the dedication that once put into uh, an activity, uh, an art form, or uh, an, exp an expression, a project, uh, or the commitment. So it's like the willingness to, to go and never stop, to go be yeah. beyond what you thought was impossible. So I think that's, for me, excellence. It's like to have the courage to not give up, and no matter what happens. <laughs> It's a beautiful yeah. redefinition that I think I, I'm, I'm loving all of these <laughs> redefining of excellence. So, Seth, do you want I to add anything? I have nothing to say. They've said everything. <laughs> <laughs> Lies. No, but I guess at the core of it, it is growth, right? It's, it's unabashed growth and innovation as we look at what the, these multiple communities and lenses can actually be. Um, at, the, at the core of it is how far we can really go, how we redefine the narrative, how we look at programming, uh, how we look at these different types of models. For years, I was um, artist in residence with the Seattle Symphony and at a time of a pivotal change. Um, and coming into this, I thought, oh yes, I'm gonna play these concerts, et cetera. And, but the most meaningful parts was getting to work with the education outreach departments. Um, to really kind of redefine pathways and directions in which we were actually going to go, how we get to the root of, of arts creativity for the, young, the youngest of the generations that are just coming into it or those that don't even have access to it at that point. So how is it that we create models and experiences um, for them to kind of have a dream they didn't even know to dream? 
So for me, that is the excellence, yeah. I just wanted to just jump in here really fast because I think when we look at this question, excellence as the outcome of diversity, we're sort of suppositioning that with diversity, excellence is now in question. Like the existence of excellence in that diverse space is now in question. And I say that because in many of the conversations I have doing ED, the EDI consultation work that I do over in Europe, um, there is this fear that if we let them in, what about the excellence of the work? And so I think when we're having this conversation, when we're looking at this question, we really need to look at it from a couple of perspectives and understand that when we look at this, we're looking at it from this external lens of sort of white fear, this sort of external idea that, oh my gosh, they are here, so things must get bad, right? And really sort of challenge this notion. And I love that we're saying, no, diversity is by definition a form of excellence and that in championing diversity and centering diversity in the work you're creating, you are now reaching a level of excellence that you probably didn't have before and weren't aware of because it was previously defined by these cultural markers, these cultural sort of insidious forms of violence that kept people out. Mm -hmm. And that by definition is not excellent. Absolutely. Thank, thank you so much. Um, I, if I can just add a, a couple of thoughts of my own, although they're, they're on a slightly sort of different, well, I mean, I just, I, I'm very inspired actually by all of these, these redefinings. Um, and indeed, I, my feeling very much is that excellence can mean um, all manner of things we want it to, and not just this sort of perfection, as, as Virgie is saying, but um, everything to do with community and spirit and purpose and kindness. Kindness in itself is excellence, learning from each other. Um, at the same time, I think there are places where there is almost a requirement or, or space for this sort of absolute striving for perfection. Um, and I think, because I think a lot about diversifying and broadening repertoire, um, I often think about how unfairly overlooked composers, and we can't um, deny that uh, often composers are unfairly overlooked because of issues of race and gender um, and, and prejudices. Um, I think often these composers are done a disservice by the sort of substandard editions and sometimes substandard performances they receive. So my I suppose the thing I would say needs to be excellent is that I think Florence Price deserves the performances that Beethoven gets, that I think that music deserves the care and the, the sort of perfectionism that we strive for uh, in everything we do, or even perhaps even more so. And I suppose that's very much something I think about with Kaleidoscope, is not taking uh, any shortcuts that we need performances and recordings of this, this uh, underrepresented repertoire at the absolute highest level to sort of silence any, any arguments. Um, and I guess, I could just coming back to, the, I, I know I, I said something about, um, is there an unfair pressure on or organizations um, centering EDI? And I, in a way, my own answer to that is, I, I think there is sometimes, that there are plenty of organizations, orchestras, groups, um, that do not focus on or even seem to care about um, EDI, um, who are playing, not brilliant concerts and doing not very meaningful work all the time, um, but somehow organizations uh, focusing on diversity are expected to be trailblazers or expected to get things right first time, which I think is a, a real injustice, that I think we need the space to try things out, to dare to fail, um, and, and to you know, be able to say, this is gonna take us a while to get right. So, so for me, that, that's the sort of further, um, further, um, direction that, that, that I, I sort of ended up thinking around this question in. Um, so now just turning to our more personal experiences, I just wanted to ask each of us, um, how does prioritizing equity, diversity, inclusion, as we all do in our planning processes, enrich the art form that we work in? Um, so I just wondered if any of us had personal learnings, things that were expected or unexpected, it can be positive things or things that really need more work. Um, or any advice we'd like to give to others. Um, as Virgie mentioned, we, the five of us are, are from two sides of the, of, of the Atlantic, so we might touch on differences of experience uh, in Europe and America. Um, might be interesting to compare notes. Um, Scott, do you want to kick us off here? Sure. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a good question, and actually, I think it, it, it's n not only it's important, it's, uh, it's actually the some of the roots and essence of uh, innovation in uh, blending uh, traditions, um, bringing different viewpoints and having 
different perspective and cultural backgrounds, and as well as um, having a, also this ability to really connect with um, uh, one another, because um, talking from my, from my experience, um, I'm happen to be actually mixed from a, a white father and a black mother, and I'm from France, and um, I play violin, and I play jazz with violin, so there's a lot of like, uh, in, in, in this, there's a lot of like um, contradiction almost and, uh, and diversity in, in, my, in my own journey. And co coming to different continents, um, playing uh, an art form that is uh, um, born in America in, in, in a way and from a European influence <laughs> and uh, also from a West African uh, traditions uh, creating uh, jazz, ragtime, and um, we often also talk about the violin being uh, the king of uh, classical music, but uh, you'll be surprised that it's actually the fiddle and the banjo that created uh, the jazz music, and, and ragtime and then jazz. So the fiddle, the violin was at the source, the beginning of jazz. And uh, <laughs> so all those things, uh, I'm kind of like um, going all over the place right now, but uh, <laughs> but there's like a, really like a, a connection between diversity and blending traditions and and perspective and viewpoints to create um, really innovative uh, art forms, music, um, and also in, in it's the same in science, in literature, and um, in in many other. Um, Fields, so I really think that it's uh, it's more than uh, something that is important. It's essential. I think it's uh, yeah. it's vital. It's crucial for the the, um, the sustainability and the innovation and the the continuity of uh, of music and uh, <laughs> education and everything basically. So yes. <laughs> yeah. Seth, do you want to? Uh <laughs> uh, are you nominating me, Seth? Yes, I am. Yes. All right, all right, doctor. <laughs> um, well, okay, so I'm gonna be very practical about my methodology when it comes to curating because I'm moved by beautiful music, <clears throat> and so I keep a running list, like a running Google Doc of just music I love. I've heard whether it's at a concert, whether it's on the radio, someone was singing something. I write it down. I'm like, I love this piece, and I'm always thinking, what can I partner that with that's less known? that's by a composer um, that isn't as often heard. And then I think, who would be really great to communicate this music? And I'm fortunate to know great musicians, excellent musicians from around the world. And I'm thinking, who would really just serve this music well? Because it's all about it being in service to the music. Um, and so once I get those components together, I often, and I look back and I look at this program, I'm like, this is really great, what's missing? Well, whose voice are we not hearing? Who's not being represented here? Um, what perspective could be added here to enhance this? And then I take that and I move forward to another idea. So I, 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 I mitigate that issue and then when I go forward to another program or whatever, I keep that in mind that, oh, I forgot about that or I forgot about this person's contribution or this person's way of viewing music or interpreting something. Because you've heard, you know, I'm a clarinetist. I've played Brahms Trio. You've heard Brahms Trio probably. You could get many recordings of it. And the question isn't can you play it, it's now what do you have to say? So I want people to play things. I want to curate programs where people are saying, they're communicating. And, and, and that for me is supreme. And so I'm looking for repertoire that speaks, that can sit in, in conversation and in concert with other works um, that might not be as well known or need to stand on their own and are great pieces that need to be heard. And I'm all, always keeping the back of my mind that I want composers um, from underrepresented backgrounds. I'm always, always, always reaching out, looking for repertoire, particularly for clarinet. So if you know anybody writing something. <laughs> um, and keeping that running tab and just always trying to create moods and moments and experiences that resonate to the human person that's sitting and listening and the person performing it. That really resonates with, with me and I'm sure with a lot of the, in terms of the processes we're going through. So thank you so much, Bernie. Seth. Seth. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess I, the process or the experiences of looking at how we're 
diversifying or just expanding. I, I try to stay away from diversification because it's, it's, it's become so convoluted mm -hmm. uh, or it, empty in certain circles. Um, it's just a, a key word, that, a hot word that people are using in some ways. Um, but yes, it is, it is the people that, that create, I guess, an experience that are able to really carry these stories and narratives, but also, I guess, if I'm looking from the lens of curation, um, it's also what is missing in the way of who's writing the program notes, who is really telling the larger story of this narrative. Is there something more that can happen here, especially when it comes to the commissioning of new work and new voices? and who's actually out there and what we can pull from. Um, especially in this, I, I have to use examples in a way and not speak in large strokes in some ways. So the latest project of mine, Difficult Grace, it was important, even though there's a, a large kind of centering of black creativity and black uh, exploration, um, not all of the composers were black, but maybe the librettist was black or of the diaspora or um, the, the visual artists that I was pulling from or working directly with were, um, or the dancers were, the choreographers were. So finding a way to still be able to tell these stories through different lenses and all of us being able to really learn from different kind of lived experiences, um, but also at the same time trying to find unique and truly sincere and powerful beings really to kind of lead, lead that cavalry. And of course there's always going to be pushback in some ways because we're all coming from different I guess different different walks of life and our different experiences, and trying to make sure at the at the end of the day or at the core of the project or whatever they are at the core of our seasons, there is a beautiful through line that really ties these things all together in a way that that, that is central to what we're trying to do. Mm, thank you, Melissa. Thanks, y'all, for all of that. It's totally true, and it's absolutely crucial. I see that in my day-to-day -day life, living in New York City, I'm so lucky to cross paths with so many different kinds of folks from a lot of different places in their life and where they were born and things like that. Uh, and what you were all saying kind of reminded me of one of what my best friends told me when we were roommates. She's also a trumpeter, but she was a middle school band director for a few years. And she would talk to her students and say, do you know that kid over there? And they'd be like, no. Oh, well, they look different than you, don't they? They're like, yeah. Well, they probably came from a different place and have different life experiences than you. You should get to know them and you might learn something. And when she told me that, I thought, duh, that's so simple. Like, it's literally that simple. Yeah. Um, and so uh, I really just valued that she was teaching her kids at such a young age that um, get to know people who look different from you because it's almost certain they're not the same as you. Uh, and the other thing that I wanted to uh, touch on was starting these students really young. Uh, so working at the California Music Center, we're lucky to have a school that is dedicated to giving children a great general education, but also bi-weekly lessons. So mm -hmm. two lessons on their instruments, starting in kindergarten, going all the way through high school. And um, two of our students were actually two of the junior winners at the competition. And yeah, they're awesome. Amazing. Uh, <laughs> they're so wonderful. And they started learning and studying in kindergarten. And that's due, I think, to um, our selection process, to the school, and making sure that it is diverse, and uh, really giving them the resources to excel. Um, you don't become really successful without these kinds of resources. So I think investing in programs that are starting students with um, an excellent and rigorous music education really early on is essential to even having this conversation. Yeah. Um, and I think that's, you know, it's certainly a huge topic and everybody is here and learning about that and that's really great. And the next steps are putting it into action and investing in it. Yeah, I totally agree. And I think, you know, all, all of our lives are improved as musicians, but also as people, if we, if we look open-mindedly and outwards. Um, I mean, just in terms of the U UK, US divide, which actually in the music world often seems quite a big divide, uh, or the US and Europe uh, too. Um, so for me, you know, personally, meeting Elena just sort of, um, you know, I think, well, opened both our worlds in this sort of wonderful way of, of all these connections that, um, uh, you know, we've, I think, just both grown from so much sort of listening. I, I've kind of uh, been so lucky to 
grow this new family uh, in the States, and, 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 uh, and then we're based in London a lot of the time. So it, that's been really a sort of very personal um, illustration of that. Um, the other thing I wanted to say is that we, we've talked about the title Excellence as the Outcome of Diversity, but in a way I feel that sometimes um, diversity uh, is the, uh, sorry, yes, um, diversity as the outcome of excellence uh, is equally relevant, or it should be, um, uh, because it's impossible to deny that a huge proportion of the world's most profound and brilliant musicians are from demographics which have been historically underrepresented in the classical music world, i.e. they're not white and male. Um, I think with Kaleidoscope, Elena and I realized that, as I mentioned earlier, we, the people we most loved playing with happened to be a, di a, di a diverse mix. And I think if we're really moving through the world in an expansive way, I think that just will happen, or it should. I th at the beginning of setting up this, this uh, uh, Kaleidoscope, we talked a lot. And then at a certain point, we sort of stopped talking you realize that some of these areas are sensitive topics uh, for a lot of people, and sometimes it's hard to find the right words. Um, and I'm someone that sort of doesn't thrive on confrontation. So in a sense, I think what we realized in the end, and if there was any advice I would give, um, is that we ended up realizing we should be talking less and just doing more and leading by example, which is, I feel is what all my colleagues on stage are, are doing. Um, and I suppose a wider question that might lead on to, and actually this was sparked by a conversation I had with Virginald uh, a, a couple of months ago, um, is that the question of what it means to be an artist in the 21st century. Uh, how can we as musicians and curators help to create this richer, fuller artistic scene for our audiences, for our communities? Um, how can we create and grow networks to include people from diverse backgrounds? And any advice to, to younger musicians, to promoters? Uh, Virginal, do you want to kick us off here? Um, sure. Um, <clears throat> I think about this a lot because the reality is, is that particularly with chamber music, you'll find that they are curated by people who then hire their friends to play. And what I've often, I sit back in Ireland, we have the Arts Council of Ireland who funds the art world. And you see all these festivals popping up and it's always the same people floating about the same festivals. And I'm like, there's something problematic about the vacuum that we've created around this art. And so I'm always thinking of ways we can expand our own personal networks, our personal friend groups. Because if we're pulling from these groups, if we're leaning on our, our colleagues and friends that we've worked with in the past to fill these performance spaces with us as artists, we then need to do the personal work on the other side of making and centering diversity in our friend groups, right? The people we work with, the people we call friends, that we need to have a wide range of friends. And I'm so struck by how in America, I can have white friends up into secondary school, high school, and then they go off and get married, and they don't have black friends anymore. Like, they don't know black people. And that's so fascinating to me. Um, and it's, you see the same thing in classical music. Like, they go to school with us, and then they go and create these projects that have never shown the face of anyone that doesn't look like them, and that's problematic. And so I think what we have to do in, in order to create these more diverse rosters of players, these more robust looking programs of, of, of performers and repertoire is we need to take the onus upon ourselves as curators, as artists, to expand our personal networks. And I say this on the board of Crash Ensemble, I say this at um, Chamber Music Scotland, we need to be more intentional about making connections and contacts beyond our comfort zone. And we need to be sure that when we're hiring, when we're investing in our, our art form, we're doing so with an eye towards the other, the subaltern voice, right? And, 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 and if we're only looking at the people in our most immediate circle, which we've cultivated, we've curated, for ourselves because we're in the safe space that we've created with the people that look like us, that think like us. We are now losing the diversity of thought. We're losing the diversity of creativity. We're losing the diversity of experience that then enriches um, these, this programming. So my, my, my charge would be to examine your friend groups, examine how diverse they are, and see where you are lacking in expanding that beyond your own milieu. Thanks, Bertrand. Yes, um, that's, that's wonderful what you just said. I couldn't say it any better because first I don't speak English very well. <laughs> but, <laughs> but I'm not true. <laughs> I'm going to try. Great, Scott. Thank you, thank you. 
I, I want to try to to bring something into the, the discussion as well. Um, so, first of all, being an, uh, you said being an artist uh, in the 21st century, how it is, well, it's, it, it is challenging, and it's been challenging to be an artist in any century. Uh, um, uh, there's just different challenges. But uh, <laughs> I, I, I would say that the, some of the, the challenges and that I experienced, since I'm not from the classical, um, uh, community, I'm, I'm, I'm a kind of a, an anomaly here. So I play violin and I play with a lot of classical musicians in an orchestra on Broadway. I did that a long time ago. I, I, I play sessions and things like this, but I'm also a, a soloist and I do my, my own project as an improviser, as a jazz musician. So I see on both sides and uh, uh, from the jazz side to the classical side, I see, I see um, a lot of uh, correlations and things that are dysfunction uh, that don't don't work really well, and um, I can tell you a personal story that happened in 2018. Um, I, all my friends playing classical music in New York City um, were um, at a point where they couldn't uh, they couldn't do it anymore because they were not hired because they are black and they are like all this orchestra. And it's still happening today, but um, where there's not a single uh, black musician in the in the orchestra, and so they decided. Uh, my friend Stephanie Matthews and uh, Matt Jones they created the Recollective Orchestra, and we all, all went to the studio for free. We didn't get paid, and we recorded um, an arrangement of uh, the the soundtrack of uh, Black Panther, the, the movie, and uh, two months later. Um, we were in uh, Hollywood uh, recording the Lion King um, soundtrack with Hans Zimmer because he decided to to use the recollective and put uh, for one white musician there would be a black musician. So every stand 50-50. <laughs> I felt like I was seeing my parents, you know, for a moment. But <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so <laughs> no, sorry. so um, so at the at the end of the day, that was for me as a French. Um, European person coming in America uh, with no, uh, we don't have the same history. I happen to be black as well, but uh, I don't have the same history as people from uh, Americans. You know? So it, it, it really, really like uh, struck me and I, I felt so moved and um, also connected in a way like um, through this American history and so, so many things that I didn't realize before because I was in my own bubble as a, as a jazz a soloist doing my, my thing and it's very different than playing uh, in a classical world. You know? <laughs> but I did the, the, con the, the conservatory in Paris when I was young and I was always uh, uh, uncomfortable because of my hair, because of my, my skin color. So uh, being an artist in the 21st century is not only being an artist uh, when you're an adult and uh, when you achieve your goals and you're professionally work working and anything, it's how you become a professional musician and your, your way to it with all the obstacles when you don't look uh, like the, the norm in a way. It's, it's not only in America, it's, uh, it's all around the world. And uh, it's uh, in conservatories in Europe, in orchestras, it's uh, on TV gigs, on uh, I see it everywhere. It's, a, it's a, also in academia when, when there's a full department of jazz and there's not a single black professor teaching black music, you know? And it is, it's, so, I happen to be white and black. You know, in America, I'm only black, but um, in, in, Europe, I'm <laughs> in Europe, I'm mixed. And uh, so I'm 50-50. But, you know, it's not 50-50. I'm 100% mixed. <laughs> so, <laughs> for me, I, I'm, I'm not 50-50, I'm 100% mixed race. So, so it's another subject. I think there's a panel actually talking about this right now. Mm, <laughs> yeah. So um, yeah, once again, I lost my first idea, but it's a discussion and Seth promised me he's gonna help me if I get <laughs> lost. So <laughs> it's your turn. Go for it. So I think the idea here, we're gonna pull it back. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Scott. Um, 
daring to look where, at where you are, where you've been trained, the pedigree, and what you thought you were going to do or what you set out to do, and maybe, as my mother would say, to eat your fear, to go forth and try to redefine who you are. Um, I spent years um, studying and being that big classical cellist thinking I was gonna become this big only classical soloist playing only these, the old classical concertos. And it was uh, a great mentor of mine, Ursula Oppens, pianist, who said, you need to play everything. I was like, you grew up in a family of dancers and jazz musicians. What are you doing? <laughs> Essentially, I feel like you are, you are hiding from some part of yourself. And that was an awakening day for me. Um, and then to get more about her own background and her own story, the part that many don't know, um, it led me to really start to find new voices and new composers, uh, and then at one point to start to commissioning it. My, my late mentor and teacher, uh, cellist Andrei Milianov said, when I was, I think I was 20, which was my first time I commissioned a piece, he's like, is there not already enough pieces for solo cello that you feel like you need to write another one? And I was like, well, no, there are a lot, but none for me directly for me. So this kind of began my idea to find new voices or find new initiatives um, and to pull myself away from kind of what I had been trained in or what I had been taught um, to do something else, even if that meant I had to play ice cellos, which I, I, I did for many years. I created these large scale installations that travel the world with these instruments uh, made fully of ice um, with uh, microphones and amplifiers in them. And it became one of the greatest things of my life that I ever did because it put me into a space of museum curators and museum enthusiasts. No longer was it just only classical musicians in the concert halls, but I was now in new spaces with new audiences and had to find a new way to still express and emote and storytell. And so I think it's important for anyone, whether you are a curator or a VP of artistic planning and administration, you are a student, you are a parent, you're an aunt, you're a pet lover, that you are challenging kind of where you are and what you see or what you think you are doing. Um, more so, where, where can you actually go with that? Um, and how, how can you lean into that in a way that may actually be uncomfortable with it, but in the end, it may also transform you and transform your programs, especially on the educational and outreach um, modules for all, the, all these orchestras and arts initiatives. Um, so for me, that is the 21st, I think taking a, a good hard look at where you are and dare to be different, dare to do something a little bit. And, I, and that can come in small fragments, I can, like small steps for you. I'm not asking people to necessarily turn over everything in one day, because I know that's not Thank realistic. You. Thank you. I, I'm slightly worried we're running behind schedule. I've been shown the 20 minute card, which means we need to move on to questions and answers. And let, but do you have something you want to quickly? Yes, I would love to share. And then, we'll, then we'll, we'll, then we'll go to questions. questions. Yes. Uh, so I totally agree with everything y'all have said. And I think that it is difficult to be an artist right now in the world. Um, I was immediately kind of taken back to this moment during my freshman year of college. I was sitting in my lesson with my teacher, and he looked to me and he said, Melissa, you, Melissa, you are going to have to work two times harder as a woman to make it as a trumpet player in this field. And I was like, okay, let's go, let's do it. And I didn't really think too much about it afterwards because um, I was challenged by my peers and went through all the steps and did everything that I thought was the correct thing to do in order to become a trumpet player, um, or at least a professional trumpet player. And uh, there were many times where I just got, kind of hit a roadblock. I was like, oh, okay, this isn't exactly what I want to be doing. Uh, I thought I wanted to be a music teacher. Uh, okay, I switched to performance, don't want to do that, don't want to sit in the classroom. Uh, I thought I wanted to be an orchestral musician really don't want to do that. Uh, then I thought I was going to be a chamber musician. And I was like, I don't know, back to orchestra. And then I quit playing altogether because the pandemic happened. And I was kind of like, there's no more options for me. So I'm going to um, I'm going to be an administrator at a nonprofit. And during that time, I co-founded a nonprofit called Brass Out Loud. And we started an online seminar series that featured a lot of uh, diverse musicians from orchestras, educational um, institutions, and also had a lot of mindset and growth classes like that. Um, so when I moved to New York, I 
was working straight at the Cafe Music Center and it was kind of the best thing that ever happened to me because after that I started playing again. And in New York, I now play all of these different things and more, um, including ragtime, which I never even thought that I would explore. Um, jazz, orchestra, chamber, new music that is quarter tones and microtones. I'm just like, what the heck am I reading here? Uh, but it's really expanded my life and, uh, and my musicianship. And, and, I, and I continually teach my, my studio of trumpet students who teach me more than, than I can teach them, I think. Um, they all have such unique perspectives and come from so many different walks of life. Uh, I have one student who's 92 years old. And <laughs> he, yeah, he's amazing. Um, and he, on every occasion, like birthday, Christmas, he gets me this big bottle of wine. And I'm like, <laughs> thank you. Uh, uh, so in all these times, I think what has really kept me going is staying very open and staying very curious and also being very, very flexible. Uh, so if there's one bit of advice I could give to younger folks in college is be flexible and be curious and be open. If something is not what you think it is, um, you can respectfully disagree, but I think it's important to keep your ears open. Um, I was just at Chamber Music America last weekend and there was this really great panel discussion and one of the exercises was, okay, turn to your partner, you have to zip your mouth, keep your ears open and listen to this person speak for five minutes. And that is really hard to do, to not talk. Which, if you know me, my boyfriend's right here, I talk a lot, I love <laughs> to talk. <laughs> um, and listening and, and just kind of actively listening, but not in a way where you're saying, uh-huh, yeah. Um, just really, really listening. And you're gonna soak up so much more um, about what this person is actually trying to say. And then we flipped it. And uh, it was a really funny exercise because I was talking with uh, the programming director of Duke University. And I'm just like, I play the trumpet, and, uh, uh, but it was really great. So anyway, stay flexible, uh, and that's it. I feel doubly bad for cutting you off after you just said that, but um, we would love to hear any questions from, from anyone in the room or anyone at home uh, watching online. So um, do we have our question master around? Or? Yes, hello. Um, one question from the virtual audience is, do audiences the field needs to reach to expand have different expectations for excellence in addition to the virtuosity, like community connection or immersion? So I think the question is, what do audiences need to expect in terms of excellence? Does anyone want to? Um, I guess for in Ireland, what we're what our audiences seem to want is to feel like they're at home. We have a very lovely, if anyone's ever visited Ireland, you know that we have a, a healthy, robust pub culture. Um, and so if you can create a space where people can feel like they're at home, they're feeling comfortable, they're welcome, they're familiar with the people that are there. Um, as I began curating for the National Concert Hall, one of the things, one of the mandates was we have to have recognizable Irish artists um, so that the community can see themselves reflected. Because I was going like, oh, we're gonna bring in everybody. Um, and so I think communities want to be able to see themselves reflected in the process, in the work, to feel excellent. Like, we'll forgive mistake, miss notes, a squeak, if we're feeling engaged and, and, and a part of the experience, a part of the journey, because that's the, why we go to live concerts, right? We would just listen to a CD or um, Spotify if we didn't want that experience. So I think if we create a space where they feel welcomed, engaged, and are on the journey with the performer, because we're all rooting for them. I think that's my experience. If I can add something, um, you no? Yeah. Well, um, so, uh, yeah, that's, uh, for, uh, for me, the um, excellence would be like also, in addition to what was ju just said, um, to transport and uh, move the, the audience and with authenticity and authenticity can be really uh, channeled by uh, diversity <laughs> in a way because the more you have uh, awareness about uh, different cultures, backgrounds, and experience traveled and authentically connected to, um, to, the, to the place you are, the music you, you, you are doing, or um, the project you're on, uh, that will bring ultimately um, authenticity and therefore that will uh, connect um, 
with the audience and transport them because you'll be also transported. So I think it's a kind of a, maybe a way to be um, authentic and uh, move the audience. That's excellence to me. Like, yeah, if it's an answer. Thank you. So shall we take another question? So uh, my name is John Spencer. I'm the president of Chamber Music Cincinnati, and I happened to speak at Chamber Music America last week on a related subject. Um, so I want to speak on behalf of the subject of this uh, panel, which is that diverse, di diverse business organizations, there's a lot of data on this, are two to 300 percent more likely to be successful than those that are not diverse. Um, I, I don't know that there's data for performing arts organizations, but I know no reason why that wouldn't be the case. But it's not just diverse organizations, it's who do you choose to be diverse. You need truth tellers. People are gonna tell you what you don't wanna hear and what may disagree with the prevailing thinking uh, as opposed to just choosing people who are gonna go along to get along. The other thing that's important is how do you know that you're succeeding or not, it's data. It's the only way to hold an organization accountable is to be measuring. And Peter Drucker, who created this, the study of management going back quite a number of years ago, said any organization not measuring its performance is just practicing. So you gotta have a data, and data-driven organizations, interestingly enough, are two to 300% more likely to be successful than organizations that are not data-driven. Now, there's no data on what I'm about to say, but if you are both diverse and uh, data-driven, think about how, more, how much more powerful that is. And in our own case, if you do these things and a few other things, uh, including have a, you'll wind up with a 50% BIPOC board, which we have, you'll wind up presenting 50% or more uh, black and brown artists on your chamber music series and you'll wind up, which we have uh, had now for three years, more than 20% black audience in our chamber music series, which is the most of any chamber music presented in the United States. So thank you all for doing this. Uh, um, this, is, this is a great panel. Thank you, thank you. Hi, my name is Giselle Dominguez. I'm a double bassist and student at the Cleveland Institute of Music. Um, my question, well, first, I've played and premiered a lot of um, wonderful works by diverse composers and like composers from underrepresented backgrounds. And something that I've noticed is that a lot of these pieces get premiered, but they don't quite get like replayed, like a lot of music in our canon. So like. How do we ensure that works by underrepresented composers, like excellent works, um, not only get premiered, but keep getting performed and eventually become part of our canon? Seth, do you want to? You champion them yourself, and then you work with other educators that you may know, your teachers, and you teach them. Um, you introduce these works, and not just we're going to play this work, but what is the story behind this composer? What is the impetus behind this piece? How do we break this apart in a way? Because I think for many audiences, it's a situation of they feel left out. They don't have the key or the formula to what this work is really actually about. So many times they turn off because many of our classical light concerts in that way, it's easier, it's, it's more digestible for them. It's easier, they don't have to think too much. Yes, it still challenges. Yes, it's still highbrow. Yes, it still emotes. But I think for some contemporary works, or some, especially those that are writing now, that's not all of them, and I'm thinking globally, um, there are situations where people just have no idea how to access or enter them. Um, for you in your case, and when I was especially student, I think for all of us, it's getting together with our other colleagues that are sitting next to you in those rehearsals or in those classrooms and finding ways to keep playing them. I think the only way music stays alive or any type of art form is that we talk about it, we keep presenting it. And that doesn't necessarily mean it has to be in the biggest of halls. It could be in a parking garage, it can be in a parking lot, it can be in someone's home, house concerts, et cetera, at conferences, at showcases. Um, these are some of the best ways. And then talk to people that you know that are also curators and say, have you heard about this thing, uh, et cetera. I think it's just yeah. keeping it going. I think speaking those yeah. names into rooms that they don't know they're actually even in. Yeah. Thank Completely you so agree. much. Yeah. Yeah. Thank, yeah. You, thank you, because that's a very good uh, answer, because I actually premiered my, uh, my symphony, and 
it never it's been a year and I'm I'm looking for places to to play it again and and it's very challenging I get uh, so many roadblocks and even though it's been premiered with the orchestra so yeah sometimes I, I, I would add as a professional musician sometimes I don't have the answer you have more answer than me right here and I learned like, a lot, so I'm going to do what you, t what you say. It's a great <laughs> symphony that he wrote, actually. I say contact um, concert curators, programmers. Um, if you're commissioning someone, form a consortium and ha have sort of a stipulation that everyone's going to perform this work over amount of time, over amount of number of concerts. It's, it's getting as many people involved in the process from the beginning to the end. And if you have a piece that you love that you want to get out there, Tell, like Seth said, tell people. Um, and don't feel afraid to send an email to a general manager and orchestra. This is a really great piece. I would love to see it. Even just as a concert goer, I think this orchestra should be playing this piece. You don't know what's going to happen, where it's going to go. With the, with the advent of social media, we have much more access to people more immediately than we ever have before. And so you can reach concert curators much more easily um, now than before. So don't be afraid to send that email, sit there and like, <laughs> and fire it off. And We're document. very nearly out of time. We might have time for one more question with a, with a very quick answer before I give a few closing thanks. So sure. sure yes, we have this one. question is, what would you consider oppositional to excellence? Melissa, do you want to? Oppositional to excellence. Oppositional to excellence. Uh, Rather you a, than me on this one. Really, <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. Um, well, I think the obvious answer would be uh, to be doing a lot of the same of what has been done over and over and over again. Um, so not, not challenging yourself or not trying something new or not performing a new work would be op oppositional. It's kind of, there's no movement. Um, so staying stagnant, stagnant in your ways. Oh, that sounds like something my grandmother would tell me. <laughs> like you're stuck in your ways. Um, but not moving forward and not trying something different I think would be oppositional to excellence. Thank you, thank you, Melissa. Um, so you, I think we've only got a couple of minutes left, so I just wanted to wrap up, unless anyone's got something they're desperate to say in like 30 second soundbite. Thank you for <laughs> being here. Thank you for having us. Yeah, um, I, I just actually going back to the previous question because I, I didn't answer that myself. The, the one piece of advice that's come to my mind in the last couple of days, because I've sat in on a couple of panels and I heard a couple of um, conversations and sort of advice around um, networking and, and sort of how to meet important people and stuff. But the advice I always give to young musicians is, is, is be kind and be interested in everyone, not, not just the people you think are important or who will advance your career, um, just because it makes your life better. And also, you just never know what's going to lead to anything else. It's often the most unexpected connections we make. So just be as open-minded as possible, as all my colleagues have been saying. And the other thing, just lastly, is that I think you know, it's important for all of us to acknowledge that we're in a bit of an echo chamber here. Um, it's amazing to have this conversation, but we're really preaching to the converted. I don't think there's anyone here that we need to convince uh, that a combination of equity, diversity, inclusion, and excellence uh, is important. So really, let's all go and continue this conversation as widely as possible elsewhere. Um, and finally, I, this has been such an amazing conversation. I wish I could talk to you all, all day. Thanks for such thoughtful, honest, um, wonderful answers. Hugest thanks to Melissa, to Bergenold, to Scott, and to Seth. Um, and thanks again to the Boston Symphony Orchestra for underwriting the session. And thanks to all of you, whether here or online, uh, for your excellent questions and for joining us. And, and have a wonderful day. Thank you.